well, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for putting this together. This uh, it's a great session, uh, but uh, I'm not going to be addressing uh, hierarchies and hierarchies uh, directly. But I, I think some of the ideas might be of relevance. Well, um, I think we need. Well, first of all, uh, one of the important things we need to recognize is that uh, hierarchies and hierarchies are also in, uh, very linked to, the, to how people identify themselves. Now, I recently went into the literature concerning identity and I noticed a, a weird paradox uh, in the logic of identity. Now, there are two things that I believe are very important when it comes to identity. Now, there is the source of the self, and there's membership. Now, the source of the self is primarily um, a metaphysical concern, in a way, in that it concerns how a person recognizes that he's something different or she is something different from something else, that uh, I am Arthur and not a cell phone, and that the cell phone is not Arthur. And I'm so in it's in that sense. So it's metaphysical that we are uh, that there's an essence here that I'm an individual different from something else. Now, then there's membership, which concerns the social statuses that gives us or what we call today individuality. Now, just as an example, uh, I'm Chinese. Uh, I'm also Portuguese. Uh, I'm a graduate student. I do karate, and I'm a cat owner. Now, why is this paradoxical? Now, all these social statuses are not about myself. In fact, even if I say that I have horrible teeth, which I do, let's be real here, um, it is not exclusive to me. There are other people out there with horrible teeth. This is because your personal identity and personal is never about yourself. It is about other members of society being able to recognize what you are. Now let's take a look at the following photo. Can it be said that the man in the photo is a homeowner? No. And why not? Because being a homeowner is not an empirical fact. It is a social one. So when discussing hierarchies and hierarchies, we need to be quite, be quite careful because the empirical record can sometimes lead to some ideas that, which may seem intuitively <coughs> correct, are actually false when viewed from a social perspective. Now, a classic case is the one exemplified by uh, Elizabeth uh, de Marais, I don't know if I'm pronouncing that right, that the circulation of crafted items need not necessarily be subsumed to the control of an elite. Now, part of the reason why things like elites, hierarchies, heterarchies, social strategies, and all these you know fancy words are hard to identify is because they are social facts which do not always translate well from an empirical point of view. Now, in this regard, I think we need to rethink what actually constitutes a social archaeology. Now, this is a particularly polemical area of research because there is an ongoing debate concerning uh, the ontology of the social right now, whether it's subject object oriented, object object, relational, etc. Now, nevertheless, as Webmore and Whitmore argued in a 2008 article, things are us. You know, the study uh, of the social aspect of society has become quite scale, uh, stale recently, and uh, new materialisms are kind of a response to that. Now, I don't want to delve too deep in, the, in this actual debate, but I believe that to a certain extent, Ian Hodder's early work, supplemented by Robert Purcell and Christopher Watts' work on Pearson triadic relations, might have tapped into some really interesting ideas. With their work in mind, we have Pearson triadic relations, and to this I add Wittgenstein's notion of rule following and all of this culminates into Vincent Decom's institutions of meaning. Now, how does all this fit together? Now, 
As most of you might recall, Ian Hodder was particularly uh, emphatic on the idea of social meanings. His ideas, however, were partially based on Ferdinand de Saussure's interpretation of linguistics, which in his images stated that the meaning of a sign uh, is derived from its position regarding other signs. So this was a form of holism that had to see the whole set of signs. Now, understanding meaning then requires understanding signs from a holistic perspective. Now, in American philosophy, this form of reasoning is called semantic holism. Now, in the early 1990s, uh, Jerry Fodor and Ernest Lepore made the following arguments against semantic holism. If science cannot be understood unless as a whole, it would not be possible for people to understand each other because each individual will work with a different system of signs. As an example, English is not my primary language. So my level of English is very different from everyone else here. Now, how is it possible that all of you are understanding me? Or maybe you're not, I don't know. Um, so an, another example, the, the word cat will have a different meaning for you or for me. If, uh, if I live with cats, if some people don't live with cats, then cat will have a different meaning, right? I mean, this was part of the, of the argument you know, Hodder was making. Well, in general, Jerry Fodor and Ernest Lepore had very compelling arguments against semantic holism, and their own philosophy was pro-semantic atomism, that meanings could be atomistic, atomistically individuated. Now, philosophers at the time had mixed reactions to Fodor and Lepore's books. On one hand, they realized that semantic holism, you know, represented at the time in American philosophy by Willard Van Omerenquine and Donald Davidson, had some serious flaws. On the other hand, they did not want semantic atomism. That would be back going back to positivism. So they didn't really want it. Well, anyway, some years later, player three entered the game. And that was Vincent de Combe with his anthropological holism. Now, de Combe's ideas had already caused some stir among philosophers in the 1990s because it, he did seem to have a quite elegant architecture uh, in terms of philosophy. Uh, he created a third way that rejected both semantic holism and semantic atomism. How did he do that? Now, Remember earlier that I said I was a cat owner? How does one understand what a cat owner is? Now, in Fodor and Lepore, they say, you can't be a cat owner unless there is a cat that you own. So being a cat owner is a relational property. But it's by no means obvious that you can't be a cat owner unless there are other cat owners. Patently, the cat you own need in <laughs> itself own a cat in order for you to own it. Now, Fodor and Lepore are emphasizing here that other people need not know, uh, need not have cats of their own in order for someone to be a cat owner. Or in other words, I can still be a cat owner even if nobody else on this planet knows what it means to be a cat owner. Now, this is a pretty good argument. It's, it's quite smart. But Vincent de Combe made an excellent rebuttal. Now, let us return to Fodor and Lepore's example. Contrary to what they write, to be the owner of a cat is not above all a relational property. The relation being between a person and a cat. The relation in question defines a status relative to other people. In order for someone to be a cat owner, owner of a cat actually, there must be someone else who is not its owner. The juridical concept of property like every concept of a status or an institution is thus holistic, not because it requires a plurality of subjects of attribution of a given status, for example, being the owner of this cat, but because its attribution presupposes the prior application of another concept, that of status. And the concept of social status requires not a mere plurality of subjects, but a differentiated plurality of subjects. Now, Vincent de Combe's anthropological holism is one that combines Wittgenstein's notion of rule following because it is only by knowing that a cat is yours or not yours 
through the institution of private property that one can understand what being a cat owner means. Furthermore, as we can see from this uh, amazing graphic I made, it <laughs> took me hours. <laughs> hours to uh, being a cat owner involves a triadic relation. Now, I think the appeal of triadic relations, which is gaining some momentum, I, I, I mean, recent articles I've been reading, you know, I've been bringing up the, the idea of triadic relations. And I think it's gaining mo momentum because it manages to be simultaneously materialistic while maintaining a good chunk of the ideas, you know, the, that Hodder developed, like uh, meaning, symbols, and social status. Now, I've only scraped the surface here, but there is a lot to be said about these ideas and their relation to hierarchies and hierarchies. Uh, I don't really have that much time to go uh, into detail, but um, I think what's very important about this is that it, it also collapses the idea of the individual, of methodological individualism and collectivism. Because it doesn't need, to, when we think of things uh, from the triadic point of view, you don't have to, there isn't an opposition between the individual and the collective. Because uh, like uh, an army, for instance, an army isn't a collective in the strict sense of the word. But it isn't also just individuals, you know, uh, carrying guns that don't know what's going on. They're like, oh, what am I doing? Like, no, there's an institution there that makes all of them agree that, okay, these are the people that are going to be carrying the guns. They're going to be fighting the wars for us. So uh, this institution is c sort of like a, uh, it's a smart middle ground that kind of makes uh, things, you know, work. Uh, quite well between the individual and the structure. Um, now, how does this relate to hierarchies and hierarchies? Uh, now, my own research does not focus on social structures of the sort, so I don't really know how relevant this information can be. But I was just thinking about this uh, last evening. Um, f for instance, I'm a, I'm a graduate student, so inside a university, and it, the university has a hierarchy. You know, there are, you know, there are professors, you know, there are deans, there are, you know, bachelor students. So there is some sort of uh, hierarchy there. But then what is my relation as a graduate student to a, a doctor or a soldier or a pharmacist? And there maybe, you know, we're thinking in hierarchical terms. So I think that, you know, it doesn't need to be, uh, there isn't necessary an opposition between hierarchies and uh, and. Uh, hierarchies. I think uh, it was like you, you said just before, there might be cases where both are working together. And, and I think it would be interesting, you know, to go more, a little bit more into this idea of institution and uh, how people separate themselves in this way. You know, I'm a cat owner, I do this, you know, I'm the professor here and I talk and, you know, you're the student, you listen. So these triadic relations, uh, I think create a, an idea of these small, on a smaller scale, much smaller scale structures. Now, arc, now obviously, archaeologically, this is very difficult to see. But I, I mean, this is all, of course, just you know, food for thought and see, you know, how how far we can extend these ideas into the into the archaeological record and into the past. Thank you very much. <laughs>